So how, um, I just want to check in with everyone and find out how this course has, how just doing all these meditations has benefited you. Like there must be something that's happening, otherwise you wouldn't be coming back. This is my social life. It's your social life. Yay. It is. I rarely yeah. go out. Yes. Um, that's that's because you're not Ill. so well, right? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm really happy that we have Zoom. And I am too. And yeah. as Venerable Rubina always says, it's she uh, she said this once, or she probably said it more than once, but mm. You know, when I take a class, I take it with fresh eyes and fresh ears every time. So it's like I never took it before at all. Yeah, that's true. Because you know why that is? I think partly because our minds are different every time we take a class. You know, we're in a different spot, which is really interesting. And it's always so interesting to me. So today, uh, uh, t Tuesdays is when I have my uh, in-person class at the YMCA here in Marin. So today we had 17 people in that class and none of them are Buddhist. And, you know, I, I always ask for feedback from people. Well, I don't think they are and they're not, no one's identified themselves as Buddhist. And um, they all kind of like had a different take on the meditations. It's so interesting to me, you know, like the words that I say or the instructions that are in the meditation, how they land is different for everyone. So I guess there, Kimberly, there's your there's your point right there. It's, you know, it's just going to land differently with everybody according to your experience. And depending on what's happened to you in the hours or day even prior to you attending a, a class or a meditation, it's going to be a different experience, I think. But anyway, and I think one of the important things, you know, so what is meditation anyway? So why do we practice it? You know, what what's the point? And I think the main point I understand in our tradition is to lessen the delusions and to start identifying a little bit more with the um, all the positive qualities that we have in our mind. And I love this analogy of dusting the mirror. You know, like uh, that's really what we're doing because the mirror has all this, has all the purity of ourselves, all the potential. And when we kind of dust off the mirror, it's just like when we're sort of working on the delusions, when we're working the, uh, do the purification practice, and actually all those meditations we do have a purification element in them. Um, we are, we're just dusting the mirror and um, just putting a dent in some of those delusions. So anyway, that's, does anyone have anything to say about that before I move on? No? Okay. All right. So I'm going to go back over the um, the purpose of mindfulness. You know, mindfulness is taught uh, out in the community without any background or Buddhist context. Um, it's usually uh, presented as a non-judgmental present awareness uh, and this is done in these secular mindfulness-based trainings. And mindfulness can also be, you know, in the Theravada tradition, we have a, a big center here set up by Jack Hornfield um, for the Theravada tradition and called Spirit Rock. And um, Tara Brack, Tara Brack, you may have heard of her. She's like quite a famous um, teacher from that center. So you know, they would see mindfulness as attention to sensations and thoughts in insight meditation. And that's presented in various ways as a, uh, a way of understanding impermanence. So in this course, though, we're offering this a basic training in mindfulness, and it's kind of in the context of the Tibetan Guluk tradition of Lama Tsongkhapa, with Lama Tsongkhapa's definition of mindfulness it is the kind of the basis of this course. So um, we can also relate mindfulness to the development of the concentration um, and of wisdom. So it's also shown not to contradict conceptual thought. And so this way we can see more easily and 
discover a little more, more easily the differences and the common ground between this presentation of mindfulness and the popular notions of it out in there, out in the, the world. Although I don't think mindfulness is touted around quite so much as it was a few years ago. So, um, so Lama Sankapa's definition of mindfulness is based on this explanation by Arya Asanga um, in his compendium of knowledge. So this is actually really old, this idea of mindfulness. So uh, with regard to mindfulness, Asanga's compendium of knowledge says, what is mindfulness? In regard to a familiar object, your mind is not forgetful and operates without distraction. This indicates that mindfulness has three features. One, it's observed object. It's a familiar object. Since mindfulness does not occur with regard to a previously unfamiliar object. Its subjective aspect or manner of apprehension is your mind's not forgetting the object as indicated by the phrase, your mind is not forgetful. In this case, it is your mind's non-forgetfulness of the object of med meditation. And third, its function is to keep your attention from wandering from the object of meditation. So then Lama Tsongkhapa qualifies mindfulness with another feature, to know its object with a sense of certainty. So mindfulness also has this way of apprehending its object that carries a sense of certitude. If while maintaining concentration, you stabilize your mind casually without a solid sense of certainty about the object, then your mind may take on a limpid clarity, but it will not have the vivid intensity of certain knowledge. So you will not develop powerful mindfulness. Therefore, subtle laxity will be unchecked and then only flawed concentration will ensue. So this is interesting. Mindfulness in this presentation is the rope or the glue that connects our mind and attention to the chosen object of meditation and sustains that connection over time, keeping the object in awareness. Familiarity with the object is a key element of this definition of mindfulness. And when we repeatedly attend to that object of meditation over a period of time, we build up many associations of different kinds of experience between our mind and the object of meditation, which forms the basis for enhancing mindfulness of the object. And by taking care to establish many associations of positive experiences with this object in our meditation, eventually our mindfulness will enable our mind to gladly engage with the object effortlessly without distraction. And one of the reasons I keep focusing on the breath is because it's something that's with us all the time. So some people prefer to use an object of meditation like a ball of light or an image in their mind. Um, I, I really feel, that the, because the breath is with you, you can feel it. You can feel the belly rising and falling. And because you're always breathing, it's, you know, once you've noticed that your mind has gone off for a little bit of a wander to go out and check something else, you can very much just gradually bring your mind and focus back again on the breath. So having emphasized the importance of a familiar object and the association of the mind with it in the classic definition, nonetheless, we can still be mindful of objects that we are not familiar with after all, we must start somewhere in the cultivation of mindfulness. This form of mindfulness, when an unfamiliar object appears to the mind and can be held for only a short time before being interrupted by distraction, is where most of us start the journey of developing mindfulness, concentration and wisdom. Therefore, we need not to judge it harshly. So... And rather by building on and strengthening such mindfulness, 
through repeated engagement with the object, we will come to enjoy powerful mindfulness and its benefits. So, you know, I, I wonder why people aren't getting bored in the Vajrasattva meditation. And then not only are they not getting bored, but people, we're doing the same thing every night and more people are coming now. And I really, as I, I've been thinking about it a lot, and I just think it's got a lot to do with we're just doing the re repetition. We're doing the same thing over and over again. And I know that also in our yoga practice, you know, my yoga practice, I can go to class once a week or three times a week or five times a week or once every two weeks. And the most benefit I get is from repetition, doing the same thing over and over again, reminding my body, my breath, what I'm supposed to be doing. And I feel it's the same thing with meditation. It's like, and you know, as my chiropractor says, you got to, you just got to keep moving the body. So you have to keep reminding because, you know, we have not only distractions, just regular distractions in the mind, but we actually have all this amazing technology around us that's so fascinating and also particularly specifically designed to keep us engaged. And now we have AI that kind of very creepily follows us around and decides from what we watch and how long we spend looking at something, what, what we like to look at. And in order to keep us engaged, we get more of that. And it's just the creepiest, most bizarre thing ever. And so this is a kind of a thing that pulls us away. I'm so happy to hear on, I listen to the New York Times podcasts in the morning. And right now, schools are starting to ban phones. So that, um, and phones were banned in school because kids were using them in the 90s, I think, to uh, set up drug deals. And they had pages and they were going off in class. So then they banned the phones. And then there was a, a school shooting, um, one of the first big school shootings. And then parents insisted that children have their phones with them. So there's this, there's this thing, um, children having phones in class is super, super distracting. And it's also very um, difficult in terms of social connections because people are getting bullied. So we have a lot in our environment now that we can, that we are getting kind of in a way addicted to. So it's very, very distracting. So I think it makes meditation in a way harder. And I'm, I'm noticing that the people in my group in um, at the YMCA, they're all uh, older. So they're not quite so familiar with all of this technology. Not everyone's older, but majority of people are, are over 50. So they're having, and they all come into the room and they're just kind of like, Shoo. they all just want to settle in and be quiet. And that tells me a lot also about what their lives are like. So, you know, no matter how much, you study or how much, how little you study I think repetition is the key it's just and this is what Lama Sankarpa is saying you need to familiarize your mind with virtuous things rather than with non-virtuous things and I, I'm not a good example of familiarizing my mind with virtue I mean I, I do but I, I'm just as happy as the next person to be looking at Netflix or whatever you know and, and and I'm aware of it when I'm watching it. It's like, I'm wondering if this is really good for my, <laughs> my health, my mental health, my sleep health. Anyway, um, so I'm, I'm thinking for those of you who are, well, all of you, I think, are in the Vajrasattva meditation. So have you found it beneficial over time to just do the same thing over and over again? I've found it tremendously beneficial. I've I've watched. Okay, I'll give me an example. When I, it's great. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I've seen my anger um, decline over the what three and a half years. Wow. I've seen my anger decline. Um, I'm see, I'm seeing um, my my um, I'm thinking kinder thoughts to myself. Um, I'm not 
gossiping as much. You know, I've gone through, you know, these very, various things that, oh, I don't like that about me. And I've seen that. Um, and I will tell you, I'm so very proud of myself today. Um, Venerable, you, you don't know this about me, but um, when um, I get caught doing something I shouldn't be doing, like today I was speeding and um, a man shook his head at me, you know, just really. <laughs> Normally I would have flipped him off. Oh, <laughs> And you didn't. I didn't. I didn't Yay. today. It was Shut like up. the most amazing thing ever. And that's what I've been working on. My reaction to, yeah, when I do things I know I shouldn't be doing, like speeding, or, you know, I had um, my dog off a leash the other day and somebody called me out on it. I told them to F off. Well, I don't like that about myself. So today <laughs> I was amazing. I didn't flip anybody off. <laughs> I'm very proud of you, Shayla. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I, I also think that coming, doing the same thing over and over again, it's why it's how ballet is trained. It's how gymnasts is trained. It's how anybody is trained to do anything is just doing the same thing over and over again. So with the, with the practice of meditation, even because like the first time we, in our high chosung, when we do our um, meditations uh, at the YMCA, the first meditation we do is just three minutes of single point of concentration excuse me and I do that at the beginning of the class so they can get a sense of before and after and it seems to me that even if you only manage to sit down for three minutes and focus on the breath every single day you're going to get benefit from that so uh I I think there's some a huge amount of wisdom in it and you know of course Lama Sankapa Lama here is you know he was dealing with you know people who were taking you know were monks and nuns and uh I mean this is these are very old texts and guess what we're still doing it you know it's uh hi Phyllis it's just kind of very interesting to me that something that is this old is still going strong um must be something in it so let me get back um, to this idea of a, the importance of a familiar object and the association of the mind with it in the classic definition. Um, and also to, you know, I guess when we're talking about objects that we're not familiar with, this can be, so say you're used to perhaps um, breathing through the nose and feeling a, so I was taught when I did the Theravada meditations, they taught us to focus on the spot at the base of the nose. But my guess is if your nose is shaped differently, if you have a longer nose or a broader nose, you're going to feel the breath coming in and out in a different spot. Um, so the familiarity of that for me is works. But, you know, there is also this idea of feeling the, the chest rising and falling or focusing on sensations on the crown of the head. And this, this can also be a focus of concentration as well. And so it might be a good idea every now and then to pick something that is an unfamiliar uh, uh, focus of concentration, just so uh, you can just test yourself in a way. But I think, um, and then they were saying, you know, don't worry about it if, you know, it's, it's a bit harder. Um, in that you will be more likely to get distracted more easily because you're not familiar with it. So I think the emphasis here is on familiarity. So in the Guluk tradition, the mindfulness is extensively presented and cultivated in this context of developing meditative concentration or calm abiding. So Lama, Lama Sankapa highlighted mindfulness as the main technique for accomplishing such states of concentration. So it is the great treatise on the stages of the path to enlightenment say, it is said that you achieve concentration on the base of mindfulness and that mindfulness is like a rope that actually fastens your attention to the object of meditation continuously. So mindfulness is the main technique to sustain in achieving concentration. This is this is different. It's a little bit different 
to the more popular explanations that associate the practice of mindfulness as exclusively aimed at developing insight, which is which is where the Theravadan tradition would like you to go, where I was trained to go, is you're developing insight. So there's an added benefit to present the training of mindfulness in relation to calm abiding, which is what we're doing here. This will enable beginners to settle their body and mind into the practices of mindfulness because um, mindful attention to the object of meditation, such as the body, helps calming the disturbances of physical tensions and mental reactivities, which is what we're doing also in our um, Vajrasattva practice. And it also, you know, we don't just have the body and the mind. We have this subtle, we have very, very subtle nervous system going on that we are in our body, which we can't necessarily see. We have energetic systems. We have the breath. And when we're all kind of distressed and upset and busy, all of this kind of gears up and your cortisol levels rise and sometimes it's hard to get them back down again and so i'm i'm doing a little experiment right now i've on my apple watch i have what's called a stress monitor and it has a neutral setting and a good setting and a watch out setting and a gosh you're stressed setting so i'm curious as to what activities are causing my, are they measuring it through my skin? So I'm very curious as to what activities are creating uh, stress in me. So like, for example, last night, so yesterday from four o'clock in the afternoon through to when I took my watch off before I went to bed at nine o'clock, I was in new, neutral mode and I, I was teaching and eating. So I was teaching from six to seven and then uh, 8 to 8.30. And then this morning, when I was teaching at the YMCA, which you think would be a, a stressful situation, again, I was in neutral mode. And then this afternoon between 3 and 4, when I was dri driving and shopping, it said I was it was good. Oh, and here we go again, 5 and 6 p.m. Doing this meditation course with you now is, is I'm in good mode no stress at all so I'm I'm just very curious as to what is going on in my body what is going on in my mind and my environment that is telling me so it's fascinating anyway so that's what I'm I'm doing because I I want I don't want all of this meditation just to be kind of like woo woo up in the air and you know this these texts were written thousands of years ago well maybe one or 2,000 years ago, and maybe more than that, a few thousand years. <laughs> anyway, whatever, a long time ago. And so does it still relate to today with different levels of stress? So I want to now, does anyone know what calm abiding is? No? So I'm going to show you my beautiful... I'm just going to share this uh, image and then I'm going to try and find a way to explain it to you nicely. So this, you must all be familiar with this one, right? Yep. Okay. And I'll, I'll, I don't actually have it here with me. I need to find, I don't want to lead you astray. So I need to find... I have to make sure I get the right thing. Here we are.
So the the I have this um well, the description of this particular image is in uh storage right now. So you know most of us are here in this I don't know if you can see my cursor. Can you? So go down to the bottom of the page and you see a monk holding a hook um and a and a lasso. So most of us are around here. We we haven't even got onto the path. We're still kind of me messing around down here. And this is representing the clear understanding and the mindful recollection. The elephant represents the mind, the black elephant, and the black, the black color represents the mental dullness. And the monkey is this distraction or mental agitation, and it's also black in color. And this stage is achieved through the power of study or hearing. And the monk fixes his mind on the object of concentration. And he is depicted as chasing the elephant with a lasso and hooked goad. And the monkey rolls, runs wildly, leaving the, leading the elephant. So what you can see is happening here is the mind and the monkey and the distractions are way ahead of us. <laughs> so we get to stage two you know the monkey and the the monkey and the elephant are still racing ahead of the monk but you can see they've slowed down and there's a little bit of white appearing so let's see what they say here in the stage in the stage two of meditation where where you can see the monkeys the monks uh monkey slowed down that's this guy here and i'll go through it again i want to go through it again next week with the actual description because it's actually a little bit better than this one and it, it won't hurt us all to do it again um so this stage is attained it's called shamata meditation it's attained through the power of concentration and lengthening the period of concentration on the object so it just means that if you before were meditating for three minutes and you're able to concentrate for 20 seconds uh, when you get to this stage, you're actually able to concentrate for a little bit longer and lengthening your attention uh, to the object, remembering the object. And there are five sense object offerings, uh, the silk, touch, the fruits, taste, and the conch, smell, symbol, sound, and mirror, sight. And I'm just wondering if they're showing in here. Oh, yeah, here they are. There's fruit, symbols. There's a mirror. Okay, so it's not it's not really this. It's a different tanka. So stages three and four is the power of memory, and again, samatha meditation, and uh, attained through the power of memory and recollection. And the meditator here should hold the clear and detailed concept of the object. And the monk finally lassoes the elephant and fixes the wandering mind of the object. The hare. Like, like the rabbit, which now appears on the elephant's back, is representing the more subtle aspect of sinking or mental torpor. So where have we got? There's the hair there. So that finally the monk's kind of got a hold of the mind there. And look, the distractions are at the back. The monkey's kind of holding the elephant's tail a little bit more subdued. And all the elephant monkey and the hare uh, looks back, having recognized the objects of mental distraction. So stages five and six are the power of comprehension. This stage of shamata meditation is attained by absorbing the power of clear comprehension. The monkey now follows the elephant. The monk hook, hooks the elephant with his kind of that, that, that goad or lasso, which shows that the mind has stopped wandering. And the hare disappears at this stage and the mind has controlled and pacified. So, you know, I don't know if I've ever even been at this stage, quite frankly. I mean, this is, yeah, this is an extraordinary stage to be at. And I think when you get to this kind of stage, I think it was Venerable Rene Fusi, who's been meditating since he was about 21 in our tradition. And he said this, extraordinary bliss that you experience at that 
you know, I think he said even at the fourth or fifth stage, so even where the elephant's just half half kind of black and half white is is more blissful than anything you will ever experience in the physical realm by taking drugs or, you know, having intimate contact with others. So then we get to stages seven and eight, the power of diligence. So these stages are attained through the power of enthusiastic perseverance, which is also one of the six perfections. So now the monkey leaves the elephant and squats behind the monk in complete submission. And there are traces of the black on the elephant, which means that the subtlest sinking and scattering may continue to arise. So that's there. You can see 23, 24, 25, 26. You can see the back of the black on the elephant. And the eighth stage, the monkey disappears and the elephant completely white. This represents the single pointedness of mind. And so here we get to the power of perfection. I'm going to share this with you because I think it's, I'm going to stop sharing this one. I'm going to share this other one where I am right now. And let's see. Yeah. Because that's such a sweet image. So this is perfect equanimity. This stage of perfect equanimity, uh, as the path has ended, the elephant is now at rest. It's from the heart of the monk emanates a rainbow. So here we're at a very high level here. The upper part of the tanka represents the 10th and 11th stages where the monk flies alone, the body, bodily bliss. He, he rides the elephant, attainment of samatha. So there's the bliss there's attaining samatha and riding the rainbow elephant across the rainbow mental bliss the monk wields the flaming sword of perfect insights and rides along the rainbow from his heart emanates the two dark rainbows which represents the karmic hindrances mental illusion and the obscurations of the insights instincts of mental distortion Okay, so this is from uh, Robert Beer. It's kind of famous. Okay, did that make sense? Did we all identify what stage we're at? I could tell you where I am. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to include that because I really feel, um, you know, because there's so many words in this course. I wanted to give you guys a sort of a picture, something a little bit, a picture. Okay. So um, mindfulness also plays an important role in the development of insight or in, in, development of wisdom in our tradition. And it's relevant to our training in wisdom and to developing insight and it, that can unite with calm abiding. So the mental factors of mindfulness, concentration and wisdom are three of five object ascertaining mental factors that come into play when we need to uh, ascertain and get to know our object a little bit better. In f and the nature of the four applications of mindfulness has been explained as mindfulness and wisdom. So, I mean, these texts are very highbrow. You know, we can look at the following explanation of the etymology of the phrase applications of mindfulness which is a paraphrase of Lama Tsongkhapa's explanation in his Golden Garland commentary on the ornament of clear realizations. So, you know, this is old, 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 old. Um, so, Vasub, the Vibash, oh, I won't, then you're going to ask me what that is. Okay, so we'll just, this one, uh, um, okay, I'll just, I, I won't go there. Vasubandhu explains that initially wisdom finally investigates the meditation object after which it is held by mindfulness. Thus, application of mindfulness means that mindfulness is applied to the object of wisdom. We can understand this way if interpreting the phrase application of mindfulness to mean that mindfulness closely focuses on an object or its aspects through familiarity 
and repeated engagement whereby wisdom can better discern its characteristics. Wisdom investigates and analyzes the object leading to a better understanding and knowledge of it whereupon mindfulness is applied to firmly stay with a conclusion and familiarize with it. So for example, if you have, while you're meditating, if you happen to have some kind of an insight, that would be wisdom. And then what they suggest is if you do have a, uh, um, and some kind of insight or aha moment while you're meditating, that you hold on to that moment because they're very slippery. They can disappear just like that because our mind isn't stable. Our meditation isn't stable. So the, what they're suggesting is that you just focus in on that insight and try and hold it, try and get a feeling for it, try and make it larger. So in our, also in our tradition, when discerning analysis is applied to an object held by mindfulness, this can involve thinking, reflection, and contemplation using different concepts, spiritual quotations, and correct reasoning. Therefore, mindfulness does not exclude thinking or concepts in our presentation. This also contrasts with the modern, some recent explanations of mindfulness um, such as uh, mindfulness in plain English. Mindfulness is non-conceptual awareness. Another term for sati is bare attention. It is not thinking. It does not get involved with thoughts or concepts. It is rather the direct and imme immediate experience of whatever is happening without the medium of thought. It comes before thought in the perceptual process. However, in the Theravada tradition is also not correct to say that mindfulness is never associated with thought, conceptual evaluation and reflection. So just saying how mindfulness is, is differing in this just kind of like everyday world. And I, I have to say that for some, some people that um, some of this non-secular mindfulness meditation has caused some people to um, end up in a psych ward. So, you know, for some people, meditation may not be the best thing to do or meditation not kind of guided correctly. So in our presentation of mindfulness, we want to highlight the compatibility between mindfulness and thought processes. So functional ways of thinking and reflecting facilitate a better understanding of the object of mindfulness under investigation, leading to wisdom and insight. Mindfulness is not contradictory to this and can further um, facilitate our ascertainment of the true characteristics of its object. So on the other hand, dysfunctional involuntary thinking that is associated with afflictions is abandoned by our cultivation of mindfulness focused on a virtuous object. Mindfulness does not mean that we're not allowed to think and reflect. So I think that's just kind of important to get across. So just to summarize what mindfulness is without, forget, without forgetfulness, so we can engage uh, in an object without forgetting it or losing sight of it. And that's why breath is good, because you're not going to forget that you're breathing. It depends on familiarity. So this strength of our mindfulness is dependent on how familiar we are with the object. The greater the familiarity, the stronger the associations, and better our attention. And it helps to prevent distraction. It keeps our, our attention from wandering away and with certainty, when we're mindful of an object, we fully attend to it and get to know it with a sense of certainty. We are not attending to it half-heartedly or absent-mindedly. And when we give our full attention to our object of mindfulness, 
which can be the sensations in our body, the words of a loved one, the feeling in our heart or the thoughts that are flowing through our mind. So you, you know that when you're you know, in love with someone, you can have complete single point of concentration on that person. So we are, we're capable of focusing. So it's, you know, mindfulness is important because it's, it's associated with managing our reactions to stress and difficult emotions, which is what Shayla was just talking about, how she's been able to reduce her anger and not to flip off people when they tell her off for doing things she knows she shouldn't be doing. <laughs> and it's helpful. I mean, even um, we have a insurer assurance company here that owns hospitals called Kaiser. I don't, I don't know if there's Kaiser in other parts of this country, but it's, they are even paying for their patients or their members to go to the YMCA. They pay people to teach their members um, meditation because it's helpful um, because a lot of our problems stem from this mindless, habitual, maladaptive reactivities and create stress in our lives. And, you know, some of these habits that we have may have been helpful in the past uh, but they, they don't work now. They get to a point where maladaptive behavior no longer really serves us. So some of us cope with stressful situations by a kind of not being present and thinking ahead in the future. And this, when this becomes compulsive and persistent, we find it hard to stop, even when planning and thinking are no longer effective, because that's our go-to. And mindfulness can help us to rechannel our attention to what is relevant and decouple our attention from these habit energies, as I like to, to call them. So let, let's do some meditation. I've been talking quite a lot. And this is the first one, is simple mindfulness of body through touch. So does anyone have any questions about all of that blah, blah? See, you all came here just to meditate. I know. No, I have a question. Oh, you do. Who's what's that? what's an what's what does secular mean or non sec? You know, you talked about people who. Have... I I think non secular is mean they don't belong to any particular religious group. Oh, okay. I thought that was what it meant, but I wasn't sure. Yeah, and I probably maybe said secular rather than non secular. Did I? No, I think you said non secular. I just okay. went. What does that mean? <laughs> Thank it, you. Yeah, and his actually his holiness has tried to have a lot of non uh he's tried to ha create a lot of talks and meetings between people of different religions. Yes. And I think what he's trying to do is to remind everybody that basically we're all the same. We all want to be happy, we all don't want to suffer and we all have this extraordinary capacity. And everybody just wants to love and be loved. It just is so, so simple. But then we've created these elaborate kind of systems according to our culture. It's very interesting. Um, yeah, and then we fall into certain things. I have no idea. I grew up in Australia. How did I end up dressing like a 12th century uh, none, I'm not sure. Anyway, still wearing the same clothes. It's amazing. <laughs> anyway, just as well, I like maroon. Um, okay, so let's just settle into a nice, comfortable seated posture. And um, let's just go through the settling process because I think it's quite important to not just jump into meditation because I don't, I don't think it's helpful. So if you are sitting on a chair with your feet down, have them about a hips width apart, knees about a hips width apart. Uh, otherwise, you can have your legs in the cross-legged, regular cross-legged position. That's helpful. But if you do, I would put a couple of cushions underneath either knee and then you can kind of feel like you're supported and Robert, given you're up against the wall, can I suggest 
you put a rolled up towel if you've got one or a cushion behind your uh behind your yeah just put that behind your upper back see what happens see that's comfy right and it's keeping you upright there you go that's great all right yeah oh you look so different amazing <laughs> okay all right you can have your hands uh just resting in your lap uh right hand nestled in the left with the thumbs touching now these these are all of these um mm -hmm. sorry i haven't adjusted my microphone all of these uh these are hand mudras and they're all meaningful they all have a purpose and it's usually on a very very subtle level that we can't see or understand and you know as i say lama zaparimbishe would talk about this particular mudra that i have here um activating the bodhicitta channel so that just indicated to me that we have a lot of uh, very subtle, subtle systems in our body, in our energy around us that we don't aren't quite aware of. So in a way, this is why we really need to be careful about what our diet is, not just what we eat, but what we listen to, what we watch, what we choose to think about. Uh, yeah, it's interesting, you know, it's worthwhile considering, you know, what it, this stuff I'm watching, is this helpful to me really? Like, you know, when you watch a kind of like a scary movie or a scary crime thing before you go to bed and then, of course, you start thinking that everybody's going to come in and <laughs> in, in the door and the window and every sound has a meaning. It's just kind of like uh, not helpful. So imagine now your shoulders are aligned with your hips and your, as best you can, your ears are aligned with your shoulders. So now, Robert, you've got this cushion underneath your, uh, round about your shoulder blades. This probably is a lot easier for you to do. So just allow yourself to, all of you, to rest into this position. And now imagine your spine is this beautiful string of pearls of light stretching from the base all the way up through the crown of the head and beyond. And just lengthen your spine. And lengthen your neck. Now go to the crown of the head and maybe you can notice some sensation there. A little bit of tingling. I remember, you know, occasionally I have my hair a little bit longer than others and I remember when I was, of course, you know, a number of years ago, I always had my hair shaved down to my skull and I <laughs> started to realise that it was actually quite cold. <laughs> then I allowed my hair to grow out a little bit when I moved up here to Marin just because I think some people thought I might have had cancer or something it was just yeah interesting so I allowed my hair to grow out a bit and I remember one of the first days where my hair was a little bit longer and I could feel the wind through my hair and I was amazed because I hadn't felt that for many many years so maybe you can feel, you know, something, the sensation in the crown of the head, maybe have a memory of the wind blowing your hair, a little bit of tingling. So then just relax that whole area and then relax the forehead and the eyes, the back of the eyes. Think about relaxing your eyelashes and your eyelids. And then the nose and the cheeks and the mouth and the jaw. 
and the ears and the inner ear, and the back of the tongue. Relax the back of the head and have a little bit of length in your neck. Try to have your head just a, with the chin a little bit down but not too far down and try not to have the chin too high up. And then just relax your shoulders and your elbows and your belly and chest and throat. Relax the hands and the fingers. And relax all of your legs and feet. Feel the feet in the floor again and the toes in the floor. And notice whether you're wriggling your toes around. Take a nice deep breath. So this is a very simple exercise of developing mindfulness of our body. And, and we invoke the power of a physical touch to help us become aware of the physical, physical sensations at the different parts of our body. So what we're going to do is very gently place our hands on one part of the body, say a shoulder, and immediately we'll become aware of the sense of touch between the hand and the body, as well as any other sensations there. And this is just a very easy way to introduce mindfulness <clears throat> and allow ourselves to experience being mindful um, in terms of being touched and our bodily sensations. So if you have, if you're wearing um, corrective lenses, uh, you can take them off so they won't be in the way during the meditation. <clears throat> so I'm going to pause for maybe three breaths at each place. So starting at the crown, you can re re rest very gently one hand, doesn't matter which, on the topmost part of the body, so on the crown of the head. And just allow the sense of touch to draw your attention there, noticing any sensations as we pause here for a few breaths. And you, you may notice the heat of and the warmth of the top of the skull in the palm of your hand. You may also notice the hair on your head, the sensation of the hair on your head in the palm of your hand. You may feel the pressure of the palm of your hand on your, on your skull. So just notice the sensations there. and feel, and then move down to your face and place both hands gently on your face and notice the sensations here. And can you feel the warmth of your hands on your cheeks? Breathe. Can you feel the coolness of your face in your hands? And, and you might notice that Different parts of the face have different temperatures. Feel the sensations there. Are you tensing up any facial muscles and can you gently relax these muscles and let in a different feeling, one of softness and comfort into your face? Now move your hands down to your neck so you can have one hand in the front and one hand in the back. 
if that's available to you. So not everybody has shoulders and elbows and arms that move. But just do the best you can. Maybe you only have one arm, hand on your throat. Gently rest your hands on your neck. And can you sense the touch of your hands and any other sensations there? And move down to your shoulders. Place your left hand on your right shoulder. And rest the right hand and arm maybe on your thigh or on the arm of a chair. And just say hi to your shoulder. How are you feeling today? How are you? So notice any sensations there. And slide your hand down to your right elbow and just very lightly hold on to it with your left hand and notice the sensations there. Notice the warmth of your hand around your upper arm, around your, you know, the forearm and the elbow. You can hold it from the top or you can hold it underneath. My arm's a little bit cooler than my palm. So just notice what you're feeling, what you're sensing. And then slide your hand down to the right wrist and hold the right wrist with your hand. What are you feeling? Are you noticing the shape of the wrist, the bones in the wrist? Can you feel the pulse? Now just move the hands so you've got one hand resting on top of the other. So can you feel the weight of the left hand resting on the right, the skin of the top of the right hand in the left, the palm and the weight of the left hand on the right. And notice the sensations there. And now take your right hand and place it on your left shoulder and say hi to your left shoulder. And slide the hand down to the left elbow and feel the sensations there. Move down to the right wrist, sorry, the left wrist. Feel the sensations there. Did you have a watch on one wrist or the other? And then move the right hand to rest on top of the left. Can you sense the warmth and touch between the hands, between the fingers? Now come back to the chest. Place both hands over your heart center. So the the left hand closest and maybe the right hand on top. What can you sense here? Can you feel the beating of your heart and the rhythm of your breath along with 
other sensations. So now slide both hands down to your belly and rest them there. So you can feel the sensations both at the surface and deep within your abdominal cavity. But just notice what happens when you physically draw attention by touch to a particular body part. Your mind goes there. Now move, move your hands to the hip bones and allow the sense of touch to guide your attention to your pelvis and feel the weight of your pelvis on its physical support and see if we can release that weight so that our pelvis can completely rest there. So it might be difficult for some people to just keep holding your hands on your hips. So, you know, just release your hands to where it's comfortable and perhaps place your hands on your knees and rest them there. And just attend to the sensations at the knees. You know, we may have knees that are being a little bit creative as we get older. Maybe they're talking to us. Their expression is pain. You just hold your knees, tell them it's going to be okay. Try not to tell your knees off. You know, we say, oh, I've got a bad hip or a bad knee. You know, the, the body doesn't know the difference. So you talk, talk to your body nicely. Hello, knee. How are you today? And now send your attention. You can just keep your hands on your knees. Send your attention down to the feet, leaving the hands on the knees. And we sense the sensations at the soles of the feet, the top of the feet, and in our toes. And having activated all these sensations into awareness, can we rest both legs on the ground and release their weight into gravity? So just release the weight of your legs into your ankles and your feet. And so allow yourself to be comfortable here. So we'll just meditate like this maybe for five minutes. You know, allow yourself to notice sensations. Keep coming back to the breath. If you found it helpful to do the mindfulness by touch, you know, so you maybe give yourself permission to maybe place a heart, a, a hand on your heart or a hand on the other hand, feeling the sensations there, or you, you can take any part of that meditation. You can maybe put your hand on your head. So if you find you're getting distracted, you can use this as a way to refocus and ground yourself.
And just keep bringing the mind back to the breath or to the sensations in the body if you have a hand placed somewhere. Everybody just relax for a moment. How are you doing? Um, would you like to share anything, anyone? What was your experience? So that for some of you, it's like the third or fourth time you've done this course. <laughs> so um, it's, it's different this time. Okay. So how? How so, Phyllis? Um, I, you know, I used to meditate a lot and I mm -hmm. haven't been able to, as I've gotten older, very much. Oh. And the, one of the problems is, um, my mind's wandering all over the place, a lot of anxiety. Mm -hmm. And the other mm -hmm. is exhaustion. I'm very tired a lot of the time. I just turned 80 last week. It's so, amazing. Isn't that amazing? I Yay, know. Yay, congratulations. So you're a what day? I also turned 66 last week. 27th. I'm 25th. So are you Virgo? I of course yes, on the cusp. Okay. okay. But but welcome. Anyway, so well, I'm trying to figure out what's wrong with me. And apart from the fact that you're 80. Yeah, besides the fact that I'm 80. <laughs> However, it's very um I mean, I've, I've finally calmed down, but still my mind swirls around. And uh, in the morning, I, I I fall asleep if if I do the meditation. So that's good. I, but, Maybe that's okay. Well, then I can hardly get moving. So I'm going um... to confess to you what I do in the morning. In the morning, I ride my stationary bike and listen, really listen. And I stay very alert that way. How's okay. that? Whatever and, works, you know, exactly. I think, yeah, yeah, whatever works. So I, uh, when I was first sat, it was, uh, I'm very uncomfortable physically at the moment. And, um, but it calmed way down and I did forget mm -hmm. to watch my breath. So it was a good reminder. Mm -hmm. And then, mm -hmm. um, and then I just really went into, I mean, it wasn't meditating that well, but I really, my whole body calmed down, which was great. Oh, that's so good to hear. Yeah. You did good. I think there's something really extraordinary about this physical touch meditation. It's yeah. quite it's quite beautiful. And I think there, you know, I think when the first time we did it, people were reporting that they felt so um moved by it somehow, just by the physical touch. Right. And also I had I didn't do this with the group today, but there was a new man in the the um, class whose name is Doug, and he has constant chronic pain. 
And he said the pain calmed down and almost disappeared in the meditation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it it's interesting because pain is actually not in the body. It's in the brain. The, the receptors are in the body, but the brain is the one that's interpreting it as pain or not is what from what I understand. So I think it's just incredible if you manage to calm the body down through um, the, the practice that we just did. Yeah, definitely. Part, part of it could be, because I think I, I'm starting to understand that as we get older, maybe our hormones aren't quite in balance. Like, so you may have some cortisol imbalance there. Um, I, I don't know. I'm not a doctor. But it might also be worthwhile getting a blood test just to check, see what's going on. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I definitely am pursuing some, some medical information. Yeah, and being treated alternatively, right? So. Yeah, I, you know, when I first came up here, I was in a lot of physical pain, and I went, I was recommended this chiropractor. I had to wait three months to get in to see her, and she said immediately, "You need to start taking collagen." I was a bit I was a bit resistant at first because at at that point I was fully vegetarian. I, I, I meet eat meat occasionally now. And um th- it was in within three days, my body started to respond in a really positive way. I couldn't believe it because I was waking up in the morning hardly able to move. I was just felt so stiff. So it was the fascia was just kind of like it felt like everything was sort of seizing up. And when I started taking collagen and moving my body a little bit more, I started to feel quite a lot better. So was it plant-based collagen or no, she she recommended this um it wasn't it was um beef based. Yeah. So I collagen. prefer to yeah and I I think yeah. I think that's something I need to add again. I had was taking it before and I think because you're all what you just described is what I've been experiencing. Yeah, it's it's hard. You you know you don't want to get out of. It's also my friend Judith. I was living with for so long in San Anselmo. She's ninety one, and she said sometimes she wakes up in the morning and she just can't bear to move because it's it hurts. Mm-hmm. So you know this is and my my car. I'm living in a cottage now at the back of my chiropractor's place, and she's always her mantra is just keep moving. <laughs> you know that that Nemo just keeps swimming, just yeah. keeps swimming, just keeps thank swimming. Thank you, thank you, <laughs> thanks, Sh- Phyllis. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you for coming. I just love it when you come because you have so many beautiful insights. So thank you. Thanks for being here. And I did really love the elephant again. This time I heard it much clearer than the other times. I've- oh, I might have been explaining it a little bit differently as well. It's very nice. <laughs> thank but you. But I I quite like that um, those images I found. So, oh, my goodness, is that sauce? No, it doesn't look like sauce. Who is that? Oh, that's that's our next-door neighbor who is the same age as sauce. Oh, and she comes to play with sauce? Oh, yes. that is very yeah, sweet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, Robert, how was that for you? It was great. The only thing I noticed is my foot fell asleep. Mm. So I was having a little problems with it. Is, with that, is that something that happens normally or it was do you just cut off a bit of blood flow with by the way you were sitting? Okay. Yes, yeah, just a little bit. Not a big okay. deal. The okay. worst thing I have is the hip gets seizes up on the right sometimes. Uh, I think that's mostly because of yoga, maybe. Is your sacrum uh even? Hope so. I don't know. Ah, oh, um, um. Do you go to a chiropractor or at all ever? No, I've never been to one. Okay. Let's try it out. Yeah, I mean, because I couldn't understand what was wrong with me, and it turns out my sacrum's completely skewed. So I have to go and get it once a month. I go. Okay. I mean, I'd love to go once every two weeks, but it's a bit costly. So I go once a month and get uh, everything kind of re... But my, my chiropractor is incredibly um, 
attuned. She's she's like a a complete a chiropractor geek, and she doesn't use all those kind of quite violent physical cracking. She doesn't do that. She has a little machine. It's like a little gun. She goes and it it knows what the body needs, and it goes chuk chuk, and it it keeps making this noise until the body is aligned. It's kind of fascinating. It's really interesting to see. But anyway, that um, if you've got an issue with your hip. I would take care of it because it could be something. I, I have a friend who now has to have a hip replacement. She had, and the 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 right hip has to be replaced because she had something going on in the left side of her body. the The left uh, sacrum was all kind of tense, and she was compensating on the right. So then she overused it. So you know, it's worthwhile maybe getting the body balanced out if you have the time and the the resources. So maybe just think about that. And you go to yoga as well, right? Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Usually I stretch out before I even do this. But yeah. This okay. Time. That's a good idea. And maybe after you've finished, um, you can do child pose. Uh, yeah. Something like that. Just to stretch out the lower back. Okay. Kimberly, how was that for you? Gosh, time goes fast here. Well, I'm a bit of a strange person. I have an aversion to being touched in general. Right. But you're okay touching yourself? Not really. You know, it feels uncomfortable oh, to me. Gosh, that's so interesting. So are you able to do that meditation okay? I can or? do it. I can do it, but I, I don't like it. Oh, gosh, that's interesting. Hmm. And are you aware of where that comes from? Absolutely. Oh, okay. So, So then... It's something to think about. And then if it's too much for you, we can do, of course, next week we'll do the next meditation, um, which is you imagine the sensations. Um, so if that, if when we do this meditation again and you happen to be in the room, um, you don't have to do it if it's too uncomfortable for you. You can just visualize it. Would that work a little bit better? I think so. Like, I really enjoy yoga nidra. And, you know, that's what right. I do during, through the yoga nidra. You're not touching anything. You're just visualizing. It. Yes. So, so we, yeah. So you can do it like that. You don't have to do the physical touch. Good idea. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. So just, and like with everything, you know, with everybody in here, whatever is working for you, just do that. You know, this is, you know, some forms of yoga, um, vini yoga, it means adaption adaptation so you know you adapt your yoga to your whatever's going on with your body today and it's the same with your meditation and all these different techniques as you adapt um to what what's working for you because there's no point meditating when there's a version arising in your mind because you don't like being touched or you don't like touching your crown of your head so then um yeah so just Make an adapter for everyone. Just do what works. And you're like Phyllis was feeling sleepy, and when she she's in pain when she sits. So when she's riding her standing bike, she was able to meditate a lot better. So that's just an adaptation. Chosung, um, how are you? Hi, I don't think I know you. And how was that for you? If you're there, are you there? I'm here. It was good. I'm on an iPhone, so it gets kind of weird. Uh, I haven't been in your class for oh, over a year, but I'm good. Welcome. So, yeah, thank you. And are you from Canada? No. I met I met Tubton Norbuling. Oh, you are. Do you have a Canadian accent or a Midwestern accent? Uh, probably. Oh, probably. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Because it sounds a little bit Canadian to me. I mean, I'm, I'm, well, I'm getting more familiar with the different accents all over America. But yeah, okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for coming. So, uh, it's twenty two minutes after the hour, and I think what I would like to do now, let's just do another five. Um, you know, th maybe three or four minutes of meditation before we close. So just 
We're just mm-hmm. practicing here. So just settle into a nice, comfortable seated posture. Yeah, Robert, have that cushion behind your back. A couple of cushions under you, particularly under your left. Is it your it's your right hip that's hurting? Yeah. Maybe put two cushions under there. Under that, yeah. And then maybe you can put it under your um, sits bones as well. And just be gentle with that body of yours. All right. So just realign yourself, have your hands just resting comfortably, bring the mind to the breath. And just notice, just feel. Maybe you can go to the crown of the head and just feel the sensations there. Feel the sensations in your face. Allow your face to soften. Feel the sensations in the back of the head. Keep breathing. Feel the sensations on you, in your throat, in your neck, and now your shoulders. And there may be some tingling in your arms and your hands, your palms. Feel the weight of your palms in your lap. the weight of your legs, sits bones in the chair and feel your feet on the floor. And just bring the mind to the breath and just feel and maybe remember back to the beginning of the meditation this morning, this afternoon, this evening. And just see if there's a difference. So Phyllis mentioned there was for her.
everyone just relax. Try and bring your mind back to the body. Take a couple of deep breaths as we dedicate all the positive energy we've created in this last hour and a half. Thinking about mindfulness, thinking about what it is in this our particular tradition. And just thinking about how it can serve you and then in turn others. And then, uh, you know, as just dedicate as we're moving along our spiritual path for ourselves and for others. Okay, everyone. I will see some of you in about 30 minutes. I'm just going to eat a, a wee bit, then I'll come back. Okay, everyone. Thanks for hosting, Shayla. And thank you, Robert. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you, Chosang. And thank you, Phyllis. Okay. Hope to see you all next week. All right. Lots of love. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. I see.